Hi, my name is Peter Martinson. We're here today at the Geological Society of America conference in Pittsburgh. And I have with me Dan Connolly, who just gave a very interesting presentation. I'm going to ask him some questions about it. Uh, first, Dan, could you describe yourself? Uh, I'm a person with a science background. I am a trained pharmacist, licensed. and um, But I have taken up a geology as a hobby and has become a passion. Good. Now, can you just describe a little bit what it is that you found? Uh, I found an impact crater, but not just an impact crater. It would be the largest impact crater uh, known, and it is in Australia. Uh, the name is MAPSIS for short, which stands for the Massive Australian Precambrian Cambrian Impact Structure. I have been able to do several talks on it. I've been able to narrow down the dating on it, and the date is approximately 545 million years old, which is also significant. Uh, because it is at the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary. The outermost ring, which is a far field effect ring, is about 2,000 kilometers in diameter. The more classic crater ring is approximately 550 kilometers in diameter, which is concentric with that outer ring. Now, how did you find this? Uh, purely by accident. Uh, Google Earth, as many people go on Google Earth three years ago, and noticed that there was a ring on Australia and that it shouldn't be there. And it started out as a very simple question. Why is it there? And How did why? you see the ring? Uh, just rotating Google Earth uh, from about 5,000 miles in elevation. And from that distance, the ring just popped up very clearly. Now, you said that the uh, crater, that the impact happened approximately 540 million years 545, ago? 545. Okay. Plus or minus 5 million years. Now, uh, just for basic information, how do, you, how do we know how old it is? Uh, well, the research that I've done, I did the stratigraphy of the area, which is looking at the, the layers of rock, seeing what lock, rocks were penetrated by the impact, what rocks remained intact, looking and comparing that across the surface of Australia. That was the basis of it. But in the center, I was able to get the government reports on individual crystal dating. Mm -hmm. And the closer I got to the center, the closer the dating got to that time of about 545 million years. Huh. Now, uh, do you have any other evidence that it is actually an impact crater? Uh, yes, there is, the, of course, the geomorphology. But the hardest piece of evidence, and the one that everything works around, is a rock called pseudotachylite. And pseudotachylite simply is rock melted by friction. It comes from many sources. It can be landslides. It can be earthquakes. But when it comes from landslides or earthquakes, it is in millimeter widths, centimeter widths, usually in meter lengths. But when it's a large impact, you will find it in kilometer lengths and even kilometer widths of the pseudotachylite, instantaneously melted rock. In this location, we have an arc of pseudotachylite that is 300 kilometers long, and in some places up to several kilometers wide. It's not pure melted rock. It, it is a mixture up to 4 to 10 percent melted rock. But this is very indicative of a, of a large impact because there's really nothing else on Earth that has the energy to melt that much rock instantaneously. Could you give uh, kind of a ballpark? Most people know that there was a large impact around the time of the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs down in Chicxulub. How does this compare to that? Uh, this is much, much larger. This would be the largest impact by far. The next largest would be a, an impact in Frida Fort, South Africa. Uh, Chicxulub, I believe, is number four or five on, uh -huh. on the scale of impacts. So this is much larger. It would have had a much more global effect than Chicxulub, a much greater effect on the Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, this, uh, the timing of it is very interesting because it was coincident with the outbreak of uh, organisms such as the Burgess shale organisms, these uh, uh, arthropods. It was the explosion of animals, period. Yes, the Cambrian explosion of life, right. as most people know it. Now, how do you think that this relates to that point? Well, prior to this time, Earth was barely getting by. We had come through a time period which was called Snowball Earth, in which the Earth, they believed the Earth froze over completely. Uh, we began to come out of that uh, several million years prior to this event. There was another impact called Ackerman about 590 million years ago. Uh, do you know where that one was? That was in Australia. Okay. That is actually relatively close to this impact site. Uh, about six, seven hundred miles away. Okay. 
between the time of that impact and the impact of maps is was called the Ediacaran period. This one, life began to be more multicellular. Worms, jellyfish, sea pens, but nothing really with a backbone yet. Mm -hmm. All soft body creatures. All, so, all soft body creatures. We had the impact, and then after this came the Cambrian period, when there was an explosion of life. Basically, when I describe it to people simply, is everything you see outdoors, every animal, every plant, the origins of those began at that time. These are from animals that existed prior to the impact, that survived the impact, but life loved it. There was um, a distribution of nutrients. There was a change in the atmosphere. All these things have been measured. Now, the, uh, the Adiacara are found in Australia. Yes. And they're found very few other places on the planet. There are a few other places, but the best location to find them is in Australia. And you think that's related to the, to the impact? Uh, yes, because this was, the Adiacaran is often considered the first mass extinction. Mm -hmm. And being soft-bodied animals, they would have to die very rapidly. Everything that eats them would have to die, and then they would have to be covered rapidly so they wouldn't decay. So it took a very specific uh, event to create fossils from basically jellyfish and soft-bodied animals. Mm -hmm. So the uh, debris that was thrown up by the asteroid would, would a have, lot of sediment. Would have, would have killed them, would have covered them, would have prevented any decay. Now, uh, you said that this also, perchance, spread nutrients all over the planet. Yes, I, I believe that it did. The target rock was rich in nutrients, uh, much of a mineral called feldspar, which contains often potassium, calcium, magnesium. This would have been thrown out from the impact. This ejected layer would have covered the Earth. But the Earth was different at that time. The Earth had no plants. So there's nothing to hold it in place when the rains come. So there were continents, but no plants on the continents. Correct. So for the several tens of millions of years after the impact, the rains would have washed the nutrients from this ejecta into the oceans and all the oceans and all the lakes. So you'd have a constant supply of nutrients that basically animals love and then you could, it's basically fertilizer for the planet. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that, right after the impact and actually surrounding the impact, there's an area called the Calcaringi Large Igneous Province an area of about 400,000 square kilometers, where there was a massive effusion of basaltic lava. And again, with a large igneous province, you're spewing minerals uh, and chemicals into the air, keeping things warm, carbon dioxide and the like. And again, keeping the earth warm and keeping it fertile for an extended period of time. It's not mm -hmm. just a single event, it was a single event followed by a prolonged fertilization of the earth. Now, you said that you worked with a couple of uh, gentlemen in uh, China on the relationship of this event to the position of our solar system in the galaxy. Could you say a couple words about that? Yes, I am very thankful to uh, my colleagues in China because they were the first to actually help me and to get published. But their specific work was on the density wave connecting with catastrophes. And the density wave is that once every, about every 250 million years, the Earth passes through one of the spiral arms of the galaxy. And the change in the density and the gravitational forces, they believe, shake loose asteroids and the like, and you will have an increased bombardment of the Earth during those time periods. This impact coincides with one of those time periods where we pass through an arm of the galaxy. What's the next step for your work? Oh, the next step. Four uh, steps. Well, there are, there are many steps. This is a long process. I've been working on it for three years, and I know that I'll have to work for it for many more years. I've given myself a deadline of a total of 15 years, so I have 12 more years to go. But this summer, I am working to take another trip to Australia because in my research and study of the maps, I have some very good locations to search for hard, more hard evidence for the impact, uh, things called shock courts. Mm -hmm going to the sites where the pseudotaculite is and actually date the pseudotaculite because no one has actually dated the pseudotaculite even though there's a 300 kilometer stretch of it. Mm -hmm. If, for example, the pseudotaculite 300 kilometers from the other pseudotaculite dates the same, that would be very strong evidence that they're connected to the same event, meaning the impact. Do we, we, do we find pseudotaculite elsewhere on the planet? Uh, it is very, very rare. Mm -hmm. The only time you find it in large amounts like that is with large impacts, such as Sudbury and Faridafort. This is, in my, to my knowledge, is the only location where you have such large amounts of pseudotaculite, 
both in radial deposits and arcuate deposits, meaning in a partial circle, uh -huh. and radiating out from the center of impact, that has not been officially associated with an impact. So I, I like my odds on that one.